know that it is always um, as helpful as they like to make it seem because if anything I've learned in medicine is no two human beings are built the same. We all have different genetics. We all have different uh, ancestry and hereditary issues. And so we will respond to foods differently. This is why one person may be allergic to a food while another person is not allergic to it. And so I think that diet is far more complex than just saying, make sure you've portioned your plate um, the way the myplate.gov says. Um, I, I just think there's a lot more to it. So I don't want you to get overly um, concerned about that. And as far as your um, remembering how, the portions, um, what I think is important to remember is that we eat foods that are not processed, that we eat foods that are um, high in nutrients, which is a struggle, and that we eat adequate or reasonable portions of the various types of foods. Um, I have definitely had my phases where all I ate was fast food because that's all I had access to and that's all I could get. And, and it's a thing, I understand. Um, but we should try to be aware and make certain that if we are having to eat processed and less nutritious foods that we are um, more or less complementing that with more nutritious options elsewhere. All right, so. I think we understand what all, oops, went too fast. I think we understand what a lot of these things are and what we're talking about here. Um, I actually, this point here, dairy, low fat and fat-free items, um, that is a point that I strongly um, disagree with. I um, and oils, uh, avoiding solid fats and avoiding trans fats. So uh, I'm currently taking a course in organic chemistry and we've dealt a lot with trans fats. And I highly recommend that you avoid trans fats. If you're curious what those are, it is basically vegetable oils that have been heavily processed in a lab. So you'll find this in a lot of processed foods. You don't find this in things like um, olive oil but you would find it in things like margarine or something like that. Um, the solid fats, I think there's some fallacy there. And I think there's really good evidence for that uh, when you start digging into um, data on um, causes of heart attacks and such. So one of the interesting things to keep in mind is that fat is, uh, you know, when I'm talking about um, lipids in our fats in our diet, are incredible the, the parts of fats in there are very very important for us to be able to brain, develop brain function and we need to have those fats for us to remember things and for our brain to work properly there's a lot of nutrients that are only found or predominantly found in lipids and hard to get in other forms that are very needed in our brain and so i think that we do ourselves a disservice by constantly uh, avoiding fats in our diet. Now, when I say we should eat fat, I'm not talking about um, McDonald's uh, chicken nuggets and such like that. I'm not talking about uh, deep frying uh, Oreos. What I'm talking about is um, an adequate amount of animal fats and naturally occurring fats. So things like olive oil, um, coconut oils, stuff like that, stuff that is a rather common thing. Um, the more a item has to be processed. It, the chemistry and the more modern food chemistry is an incredible industry, and they've done a lot of good for the world. But the more something is processed, the more the chemicals, the, the molecules can change, and the greater the incidence of issues for you as a consumer. So I try to avoid those as much as I can, but I'm realistic. I had to have a hamburger. I had to eat at McDonald's yesterday for lunch. That's me. I'm not up here trying to preach some crazy fad diet, so please don't uh, misconstrue that. But I do think that we need to eat fat, um, especially the animal fats and such like that. 
in moderation. Um, another point to make when it comes to fat and lo versus low fat, you know, full, you know, like let's say whole milk versus skim milk, is the fat is where a lot of the flavor of your dairy products and your meat products come from. Uh, have you ever heard somebody say that a steak tastes good, but chicken often tastes bland on its own? So well, chicken is a very low fat meal. Um, some people are like, oh, I love um, whole milk. I love the flavor, but I can't stand skim milk. Well, that's because the flavor is in the fat. That's why butter tastes good. That's why putting butter on something makes it taste better. When the food industry in general decided to start removing fats from food products and uh, marketing it as a low fat product, they often had to substitute sugars for the fats in order to give it flavor. And those sugars are more simple carbs, sometimes complex, but mostly simple carbs, and those are adding to our total sugar intake. This is not across the board. This is not standards yet. Just because it says low fat, it has to have high sugar. It's not the way it always works, but it is very common uh, alternatives. So, I would caution you to be, um, don't be overly concerned about it being a low fat product. Obviously, any nutritional decisions that you make, make those with your uh, doctor make or your um, nutritionist, but uh, try to do a little bit more research on that. Don't necessarily jump on the mainstream bandwagons of if you want to um, be healthy, you can't eat fat because your brain needs fat. And here for the next few weeks, um, months, you're going to do a lot of learning. So I would encourage you to not shy away from whole milk, regular, real butter, and common animal fats. Um, because I think that will help you a lot. One of the interesting points is people will talk about, um, and I learned this a few years ago, doing a, a specific temporary uh, type cleanse diet. I won't get into that. But what I learned was when you eat an appropriate caloric amount, all right, you know, they, they say, oh, we're supposed to have so many calories per meal, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so I eat, the, you know, you eat that appropriate amount and you still feel hungry afterwards. Generally speaking, it's your brain because your brain didn't feel, uh, didn't get the adequate amount of fat that it needed. Um, the general recommendation during the specific diet was if you eat the uh, quantity you're supposed to and then you are still feeling hungry, you needed to add more um, unprocessed fats into the diet in order to, um, so you felt um, nourished so that you got the uh, nutrition you needed. So something to consider there, um, just anecdotal uh, information that I learned over the years. Oops, going the wrong direction. Um, all right, so this is talking about prepared and processed foods, like those microwave dinners and things like that. There is a huge amount of sodium in those. And there is a concern with those that's where you're going to have a lot of your trans fats or your other processed fats and things like that. So... If you can stomach these, most of the time they taste pretty awful from my experience. Although I will say the protein bars and energy bars that they're now producing definitely have come a long way from the ones that we uh, used to get back in the early 2000s and such where they tasted like sawdust or cardboard. Uh, so they're definitely getting better. All right, cool. We're gonna bring water um, and so on and so forth. Um, We're uh, making sure I'm doing this right. Okay, so a couple of things that you want to consider. So USDA guidelines, take note of these. All right, lower your caloric intake, uh, increase physical activity, make wiser food choices, look for uh, nutrient density, um, eating patterns, um, not a person necessarily to model after on that. I don't have good healthy eating habits. So, um, these are all uh, smaller meals um, is not necessarily 
super helpful unless you're going to do smaller meals more often because uh for for true long-term weight control starving oops starving yourself is not the answer um because generally speaking when you're stressing your body by essentially starving yourself through a super low caloric intake your um, adrenal glands start secreting uh, glucocorticoids which are hormones that cause you to uh, start storing additional um, body fat. It's basically your body saying, we're not getting the nutrients that we need and we don't know when we will. So we are gonna store every ounce of energy that we can because we don't know when we're gonna get adequate nutrition again. Um, so while smaller meals may be a good, are a good idea, make certain that you're doing those smaller more frequently so that you maintain your metabolism and you keep things going and that your body, um, your uh, glucose levels know that they are predictable and reliable and you're um, not uh, spiking and cr falling and spiking and falling with your energy and your glucose uh, quantities. Um, All right, so exercise. The In general, it is recommended that adults engage in at least 30 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity every day. Um, and this can even be walking, um, you know, like a uh, fast walk or something like that. Uh, it's not just about getting your heart beating. It's not just about improving your cardiovascular endurance or anything like that. When we exercise, our uh, muscles obviously are contracting and relaxing. Well, our muscles make a make up a huge part of our peripheral peripheral vasculature, our arms and legs. And that is where a lot of our lymph um, vessels are found is through those that tissue in the muscles. And unlike the circulatory system where the um, heart pumps the blood through the circulatory system, our lymph nodes, our lymph system does not have a pump. It is a passive system that is, to completely reliant on um, the movement of our muscle. Now, if you aren't familiar, we'll get into it uh, later in patho, but I'll just mention it now. Our lymph system uh, is essentially the return lines for our blood. Now, we, we think of the blood as a circuit, and that is correct. But remember, our blood is carrying nutrients, oxygen, and things like that to our cells. And the only way that it, it can get those nutrients into our cells is by the plasma of the blood leaving the bloodstream and entering this interstitial space around the cells and delivering that fluid. Well, that fluid would eventually cause us to swell up significantly if it stayed in there because a lot of the bloodstream is a one-way trip. Blood leaves the bl vessels, but it is intended to not let a lot of fluid come back into the vessels. So instead of the fluid building up in our tissue, it's picked up by lymph vessels and carried to places called lymph nodes as well as the spleen and some other organs. But the lymph nodes are the primary spot. And in the lymph nodes, we have a lot of white blood cells that is that um, kind of evaluate or um, work like uh, guards to uh, security guards on our bloodstream to make sure that the lymph fluid that's coming back into our bloodstream, or that's ultimately going to go back into our bloodstream, doesn't have uh, infections in it, doesn't have bacteria in it, doesn't have cancer cells and things like that. And so most of our cancer is actually found in our lymph nodes um, initially by our white blood cells. And that's where it's attacked, destroyed, and prevented from entering our system and therefore preventing from sp prevented from spreading. So when we exercise, we are actually circulating that fluid and it does help us to remain healthier on a regular day-to-day -day basis because it's taking, let's say we got an infection, we got a minor cut in our arm, and we are, by exercising, we moved that lymph fluid back to a lymph node where back, um, the bacteria was identified by the white blood cells and was able to be destroyed before it started a big infection. So it kind of gives your body the head start to recognize the presence of an infection before the infection really gets uh, hold. So this is why, this is a, not the only reason, but this is a big reason why regular exercise is super healthy for our body. Plus, 
we're going to talk about stress later on exercise has a huge role in helping our um relieve the negative consequences of chronic stress and regular stress stress that will be commonly associated with the job and with going to paramedic school and we'll talk about that uh later in this chapter so please ask questions as we're going along if you have any all right so back to the powerpoint all right, we talked about this. Great, cool. Flexibility and overall physical strength are helpful. This is a physical job. We do have to lift and move stretchers, so there is a lot to that. So definitely don't underestimate that uh, concern and making certain that you are physically capable of doing the job. So, mention this. All right, if you don't smoke, please don't start. If you don't use tobacco, please don't start. It is an addictive habit. Therefore, if you use it, I understand. I understand how hard it is to quit. I get it. Um, but if you don't, please don't. I, I don't understand why kids, and you know, I'm talking about like high schoolers and stuff today, with all the information that we have available, you know, why these kids start um, using tobacco products. I, I, I just don't get it. But the... A lot of people, I've had a lot of partners that were you know, convinced that the use of tobacco would um, help calm them down, help them cope with the job, help them cope with the stress. And it's like, okay, I get it, but it's actually a stressor. It actually, it, in the initial phase of uh, the early um uh, effects of nicotine is that it is a stressor, increases your heart rate and all that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, it's just got a lot of negative outcome. Uh, so please try to get some help with that if you need to or if you want to. I do want to go back one to exercise. If you have your textbook out, page 42. Under the exercise section, it's talking about maximum heart rate. This it and uh, resting heart rate and target heart rates and such like that. This is a topic that gets brought up in your um, unit exam. I don't really know why it was chosen as a information that you needed to know, but I recommend that you um, practice that exercise and um, that math, those math problems there, and just be familiar with what it takes to calculate your target heart rate. Um, so in general, you take 220, you subtract your age in years. So I'm uh, 36, so my, tar uh, my maximum heart rate would be 184. Then I multiply this number by anywhere from, and this is where the literature varies, 0.5 to 0.78. Um, I would recommend use for the test using 0.7. So you multiply, I would multiply 186 times 0.7, and I can't do that in the top of my head right now. So that would be 128.8, and that will... Um, Add my resting heart rate to that, which I know to be 64. And it says that my target heart rate would be um, 192. Um, and so, oh, I was supposed to, I messed up. I was supposed to uh, subtract my resting heart rate from the number before. I multiplied that. Hey, let me try that again so I don't tell you wrong. So, We'll say 220. I'll subtract my age in years, which is 36, which gives me 184. I'm going to subtract my resting heart rate, which is 64. I'll multiply that number by 0.7 and add my resting heart rate back. And that makes more sense. 148 would be my target heart rate. Meaning, if I'm trying to do cardiovascular exercise, if I'm trying to increase cardiovascular endurance, I want to keep my heart rate above 148 in order to um, effectively uh, strengthen my cardiovascular. Now, the range 0.5 to 0.8, that is a range saying that at 0.5 being the lowest and 0.8 being the highest, that is where you, that is your target heart rate range. Um, so, whereas I would say 148, it could be above or below that. Hey Brian, yes. Throw 
Yes, I can set that up. Stand by. All right, so the way the formula works is you start with your 220, 220 minus your age in years. So for me, that would be 36, which equals 184. Now I take that and Take 184 and subtract my um, resting heart rate. So you have to know what your resting heart rate is. For me, I know that it's 64. This gives me 120. With this number, I now multiply it by 0.7. Now the range is 0.5 to 0.8, but I, I'm going to use 0.7. And if I recall correctly, that should give me something like um 84. with that i add my resting heart rate back and the reason we had to subtract it and then add it back is because of the 0.7 multiplication um and that gives me 148 so that is my heart rate or uh, my target heart rate so first 220 minus age then subtract uh, resting heart rate, then multiply by 0.5 to 0.8, and I'll just write it that way, 0 0.5 to 0 0.8, add resting heart rate, and there you go. And that's how that would work. That follow? Not a problem. All right, any questions on that? I. I forgot that I needed to have that done today, uh, that that was in here. And so glad we reminded me to bring out the tablet. We can do that. Um, that is it. That is on the exam. And so I don't know why, but it is. All right. Here we go. All right. Alcohol use. It is a drug, and it can modify how our brains work. We understand that. Um, I am not a uh, Lemonade Lucy or whatever teetotaler or however you want to say it. I have no qualms about consuming alcohol. But from a personal standpoint, I know that I have a family tendency towards alcoholism. There are a number of alcoholics in my family um, and that has been something I've always been concerned about uh, or wanting to avoid and as such in this line of work it can be very very easy to fall into that trap of using alcohol as kind of a self-medication to treat the emotional stress that comes after a hard call or a hard shift or something along those lines. Um, again, I don't have a, I'm not talking about, or I have no issues with people drinking alcohol. I do it myself. I very um, intentionally avoid alcohol after having a hard um, shift or a hard call 
because I don't want to create that type of a habit. And it is something that I would recommend that you consider. Um, yes, it's helpful for calming down. Yes, it's a great relaxer. And it, there's um, and there are some benefits to moderate amounts of alcohol in our diet. But it is incredibly risky to use it as a self-medication. Um, if you are struggling, if you're having a hard time handling this kind of stuff where you're feeling like you want to um, drink away your feelings, I would encourage you to find a counselor or talk to a, your doctor about alternative treatments for that type of stress. Um, otherwise, Alcohol can turn, create a real pit that's hard to get out of. Yeah, circadian rhythms. We're just going to skip this section because hey, none of us know what that is anymore, right? All right, body mechanics. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. Hope that didn't come in too loud. So, how to properly lift and move our patients, how to use our body to, um, without hurting ourselves further. There are a few good points here, I'll point out. Um, total number of body lifts you have to perform. How many times do we need to lift? Uh, can we limit that in some way? Keep the patient on the wheels as much as possible. Use stair chairs and things like that uh, as much as possible. Coordinate together, make sure everybody's lifting on the same count. One of the uh, points to remember though is make sure you've balanced your load. Not, not just your balancing the, the patient, but when you have multiple people lifting the same patient, make certain that you don't have all your strong people at one end. And um, uh, I've known crews that were of the opinion that it's better to lift, uh, to have two people lift so that there's less uh, issues with coordination where you're not getting um, one side of the patient lifted too quickly and causing the stretcher to dump over or something. Um, but I've worked, the crew I work with currently is of the opinion that multiple people um, make less back injuries. And so we'll uh, try to work together. I like the use of one person at the head, one person at the feet, and then the other two pro uh, providers on either side. Um, I often in the past used the four point system where you have a person on each corner, but I've found that that can lead to tipped over stretchers a lot quicker if one of the people on the on one corner um, if, if the people on one end are unbalanced and so you have a strong person and a weak person and so when they lift, the stretcher uh, dips. Try to lift in small increments. If you have a mechanical stretcher, uh, just go up a couple clicks and then um, readjust and go up a couple more. Don't try to always go all the way to the top, especially with a heavy load. Uh, don't carry extra equipment on the stretcher if you can avoid it. Um, when your patient um, looks as healthy as this individual, have them walk to the ambulance, maybe? No, I'm, I'm, I'm as I am not say not, he's not a patient, but, but consider stuff like that. What can we do, you know, to um, not lift our patients to be healthier, uh, to be safer? Um, Patients who are complaining of chest pain, shortness of breath, who obviously have you know chest pain and shortness of breath, should not be walked. Uh, they should because that can exasper exacerbate that situation for them. So avoid that. Don't hold your breath when you're lifting. And then obviously, as they're showing us, lift with your legs, keeping your back straight or as close to straight as you can. Don't. Uh, she's doing a really good job on the left. Whereas honestly, the girl on the right uh, does not have her butt down enough. She's bent way too much at the back or at the waist and she's uh, lifting more. Um, she will be lifting too much with her back if she stands up. So uh, things to keep in mind there. There's one 
def, uh, example of four pointing a stretcher for heavy loads. All right, I think I hit the uh, points that you need to know there. All right, mental well being. All right, so when we are subjected to stress, our fight or flight um, takes over. This fight or flight or um, sympathetic nervous system is going to res result in a large amount of glucose being flooded into our bloodstream and is intentional for us to be able to get through the stress. From an um, historic uh, anthropologic reason, you know, where did, you know, where did this re uh, response come from or what is its purpose? This is kind of built on the idea that when you are under stress, when you are put under sudden emotional stress, it's because maybe like you're in the woods and a bear uh, comes around the corner in front of you and now you need to run or you need to be ready to fight. Um, and your body needs to be prepared to do that. So epinephrine is released, your um, eyes get bigger, your heart races, your breathing increases, you have a dump of uh, glucose into your bloodstream in order to run the muscles um, and maintain. Blood is moved away from your GI tract and your sec um, into your muscles and such uh, in order for this response. Well, this same fight or flight response can be activated with the stress of a call. It can also be activated through the chronic stress of uh, just seeing multiple calls or being on the road and not sleeping and things like that or not getting um, adequate nutrition. And so this same type of response is going to be activated, resulting in the same uh, epinephrine, norepinephrine, glucose, and such like that floating around in our system. And if we don't get adequate exercise, excuse me, and if it, that stress response is not followed with physical activity that will consume the glucose and the epinephrine and use those hormones and nutrients available, then those nutrients are going to build up and that's where we end up with a lot of the plaque in our um, bloodstream and in our blood vessels leading to heart attacks. So um, be familiar with what is the fight or flight. I went through a whole bunch of those um, right there. Uh, take note on that. But And I'm going to see more about this here in a little bit and when we talk about stress. But this is why regular physical activity for us is so important because often the stress that is triggered does not um, the the um, nutrients released by the stress trigger do not get consumed, and so we're tr by exercising we're able to remove those from our system. Um, obviously, the goal is to remain calm during your situation. As professionals, as EMS providers, the intention for, is for us to bring calm into the chaos. So if we are getting anxious, if we are getting uh, worked up, if we are not maintaining calm, we're not going to be able to maintain um, calm in the environment and can help control the environment. Um, all right. so. Maintaining our emotional well-being monitored um, is not just as far as our emotional well-being for us. Yes, these are really good points um, in order to stay mentally healthy, but it's also, oh, sorry, um, thought it had it in here. It also plays a role in recognizing the needs and the emotional well-being of our coworkers or of our partner. You know, if you're... Um, if your coworker is changing their attitude, changing in their behavior, you know it's a good idea to say something, to talk to them about it. Not condescend, not attack them, but hey, uh, you seem stressed. Do you want to talk? You know, is there? You, do you need help? Is there anything I can do? Um, if somebody, in the same time, if somebody comes to you saying, hey, you seem to have changed, your attitude has changed, or your behavior has changed, um, take that as a warning sign uh, and, you know, be grateful for it, act on it. Um, if they're trying to help you, don't ignore them. Um, same with you notice somebody else that needs help. Try to uh, reach out to them and see if you can help. This industry is plagued with mental health issues and has and a lot of providers end up leaving the field because of not not being able to cope appropriately with the emotional stresses. And um, 
suicide is a common issue as well. And I've had several students and coworkers uh, commit suicide. So I'm familiar to a degree with this. And um, I think the way we treat each other and reaching out to help each other, it goes a long way for preventing that. <clears throat> All right, uh, so moving on. This is definitely an individual uh, topic here, um, but the uh, text doesn't get into it too heavily. So, <clears throat> all right, well, here we are in starting year two of COVID, and we ought to have some concept for uh, disease transmission and how that works. Um, I think one of the most aggravating aspects a year ago when uh, COVID first started coming out was the way a lot of people in our industry started um, acting like all of a sudden communicable diseases were a new thing. And they were like, oh, we got to protect ourselves against COVID and all that. And I'm like, yeah, like we haven't, like nobody cared about regular flu and how many people were out sick with flu every year. And uh, how quickly and easily it was to transfer flu from a patient to us or from us to a patient and such. This is a thing that kind of ebbs and flows. Like, you know, sometimes we're really attentive and other times we're not so attentive. And we should. We should maintain um, awareness for the potential of disease transmission um, all the time. And... Remember that disease transmission is not just a matter of did somebody cough on you, but did you touch something that somebody had coughed on? Did uh, Was it in um, the dust in your environment or something along that that you inhaled? That, something that was left there that you then contracted. Now, fortunately, most viruses do not tra travel that way, but bacterias are. Uh, honestly, the things that we should be most concerned about in this line of work would be um, bacteria infections like C. diff, or the there are viral infections, specifically hepatitis C. Hep C is, in a lot of senses, far more concerning than flu or AIDS or COVID or any of these other viruses because it, uh, as a virus, as a viron, the individual um, molecules of virus, or um, well, viron, which is an individual virus um, structure, they are. Um, able to survive, and it's not alive, so it's not living or staying alive, but they can prevent denaturation or from being denatured, altered permanently. Uh, they can avoid that for a very long time on surfaces. So if a patient had blood, uh, had um, hep C in their blood, and then their blood was on a surface, that surface could be contaminated with hep C and contaminate you even the next day. So, excuse me. Hep C is a big concern from that standpoint. Same with things like tuberculosis, uh, C. diff, and uh, sh staph infections, MRSA. These are all bacterial infections that would be also very concerning because these bacteria will live on surfaces for quite a while. And C. diff is encapsulated. It protects itself from most um, cleaners, and so it can be very hard to clean and remove. That's why disinfecting and cleaning this um, truck is so important. All right. I think we understand a little bit about personal protective equipment. We will talk more specifically about them in other chapters, specifics when we're um, when it's a chapter that requires that material or that type of PPE. I don't like this picture. I have so many issues with what's going on here. Um, I mean, let's first look, look at where the guy's got his mask. Cool, he's wearing a mask, not a bad idea, but it's not even covering his nose. He's got dick nose. Um, like, why? You know, cover your nose with the mask or it doesn't do you any good. He's wearing eyeglasses, regular eyeglasses. Those are not approved eye protective gear. When you're doing an intubation like this, there is a huge risk of contamination through um, the patient's vomit or if the patient uh, with other um, body fluids coming out of their mouth and things like that. Th there's a, and even before people were concerned about COVID and stuff, 
there was a huge risk of contamination there. So regular eyeglasses are not sufficient for um, protecting your eyes. He should be wearing goggles of some form or some type of shield. Another thing is the um, patient is laying on the ground outside. I don't really know why. He's holding a laryngoscope. He's got an EMS bag behind him. His partner's holding a BVM. That means there's probably a rescue equipment nearby. I already see somebody's got an IV in the background. I'm going to guess there's an ambulance nearby. Your paramedic who's doing the intubation is on his knees. See how he's looking straight down into the eyes of the patient? Is he intubating this guy's eye sockets or is he intubating the throat? Anybody know? Or where should he be intubating? Right. We're, and does the throat run from the front of his face to the back of his head or from his head to his chest? I know it's a rhetorical, rhetorical question, but I want you guys to start thinking like this. And we're gonna, I'm going to harp on this quite heavily when we get to airway. But he is not going to be able to look down that patient's throat and see the larynx. An adult male's uh, larynx is not behind their tongue. It is actually down inside their throat. Hence, we can see the Adam's apple. That's where the larynx is. So you can't look in their mouth, into the back of their mouth. You'll see their uvula. You're not going to see the larynx. And so you have to get their head, and I'll turn this way, heavily extended back so that your view comes down this way. When you're kneeling on the ground above your patient's head like that, you're not going to get a view. You're not going to get an adequate uh, picture of the airway. Um, I prefer to intubate my patients when they're already on the stretcher. Even if the stretcher is lowered to the ground, I'll get on my knees or on my butt on the floor in the ambulance. Why? Because I cleaned it. I know it's a clean floor. But I also um, need that patient at eye level. If you When you go to the ER, or not ER, but the OR, and an anesthesiologist, CRNA, they're going to intubate their patient. They're going to bring the level of the bed up so that the sh they're standing and the patient's head is about right here. And then they'll insert the tube, the, head, the patient's head will come back, and they will be looking straight down into the patient's um, airway at this level. Do we have the ability to do that in the ambulance? No, we, we, we can't bring the bed all the way up to that height and all that kind of thing perfectly like that. We don't have that resource all the time, but we have ways of getting ourselves into that position when we're trying to be successful. The other thing is extending the head back in order to get the airway is a lot easier if you've put towels or a pillow or something up under the patient's shoulder. Um, I'm sorry, I'm really rabbit trailing on this airway because there are just so many things about this picture that annoy me. Um, he's using too short of a blade. He's got his hand. I, I don't mind where he has his hand on that blade, but um, actually will teach you to use the blade very similar to that, but it's too short for uh, that placement. Uh, anyway, there, there's just, and there's others. I'll move on. I'm sorry, but yeah, if you're going to use PPE, use it the right way. Use the right PPE and use it the right way. Otherwise, it won't do you any good. All right. So anybody seen these masks floating around sometime in the last year? Notice that this one has a circular valve on the end here. That's a one-way valve. The idea is that if you inhale... Um, that valve closes when you exhale, that valve opens. So it's filtering the air you breathe in, but not filtering the air you breathe out. Um, for that reason, actually, a lot of states um, have stated, or in a lot of areas have said that those are not appropriate to be used. Um, CDC didn't say you can't use them, but they recommended against using them in the healthcare environment because if you are infected, you in fact are exhaling the infectious materials. We'll get in, we can uh, talk about um, mask use and functionality at a different time if you would so like. I could even share with you some really good information and studies on the functions and use of masks. But um, they do play a role in predict, preventing you from acquiring bacterial infections. But 
cleaning your ambulance is by far the better uh, method of protecting you above everything else. All right. Uh, so managing an exposure. Everybody's department will have their own policy and procedure about how to handle uh, potential exposures. And um, so you guys um, follow those procedures there. Obviously, if you get uh, it depends heavily on the exposure. Um, for the most part, things like needle sticks and all that should not prevent you from being able to uh, continue patient care and as soon as possible wash soap and water and things like that. If there's stuff in your eyes, try to get it out of your eyes, off your face or whatever, and then wash with soap and water as quickly as possible. But for the most part, the vast majority of, of exposure should not prevent you from continuing patient care. All right, uh, so this is moving, uh, let's see, hostile situations. This is back to our scene safety. Do we, um, did we properly recognize the potential for a hostile situation? Are we reading the body language of the patients and bystanders, family members? Are they, um, are we leaving ourselves a way out? <sighs> I think one of the hardest things to do is not talk ourselves into a corner and not make things worse by running our mouths. I've had uh, my own fair share of make doing that, but also having partners who would talk ourselves talk the problem up. Our intention should always to be de-escalation, not escalation. Um, I highly doubt the patient and or the patient's family has ever met your mother. Uh, so frankly, if they call you a son of a, it's not about your mom. They've never met her. They don't know that. So just make like a duck and let it roll off your back. Do not respond in kind. Do not escalate the situation. The majority of the people who are upset during a call, I've actually had quite I've, situations that were the exception to this, but the majority of the time, they're not mad at you because you're a paramedic. They're not mad at you because you're EMS. There is something else that has happened that has made them mad. And the best way to help a person who is upset is to acknowledge what they are upset about and validate their feelings. That's being empathetic. Be like, hey, I'm, I'm really sorry. I know this took us a really long time to get here. I know you're really scared. We're here now. How can we help? What can we do moving forward? What can we change? Let's move forward. Take the moment to acknowledge that they were worried, that they were scared, that they were upset, and you understand that. Now let's move forward. And some, and oftentimes, just that simple acknowledgement is what it takes to de-escalate the situation, to for them to know that they're they were heard. All right. So we already talked about the Tim's class. You guys are going to take have or will take the Tim's class. Um, this is not intended to be how to handle traffic accidents. It's just knowing about the potential risks during traffic incidents. So this gets into the next section of the chapter on stress. We will have a bit more to talk about into this section. So what I want to do now, we'll go ahead and take a quick break. We'll finish this chapter and probably chapter three after a quick break. We've been doing this for an hour. So 